Hello, and welcome to the 1840 Podcast, where each month we explore a different topic balancing modern sensibilities with traditional sensitivities to give you new approaches to timeless Jewish ideas. I'm your host, David Beshevkin, and this month we're exploring intergenerational divergence. This podcast is part of a larger exploration of those big, juicy Jewish ideas, so be sure to check out 1840.org where you can also find videos, articles, recommended readings, and weekly emails. And thank you so much to our series sponsor, our friend Danny Turkel, and our episode sponsor, my teacher, Rabbi Dr. Ari Bergman. I have no doubt in my mind that it would have been much easier to skip this episode because I think, and I've noticed this over the past few months or so, that one of the issues that we have the hardest time finding language to talk about and describe is the intergenerational divergence that surrounds denominations and different denominations. Last year, we had a conversation with the Frisch family, whose mother is a Reform rabbi and whose son is now studying in the mirror. And it really received overwhelming support and positivity. In many ways, the story was seen as a way of a family sticking together, even through denominational differences. But there were many who were upset by the episode, and I have no doubt that there will be many who will be upset by this episode. Because I think we've been having a harder and harder time discussing the very real ideological differences that exist between the denominations, particularly in the United States of America, but this has massive repercussions for the way that we create and develop the state of Israel and religious rights in Israel, that there's probably no issue that I can think of that has higher tension and more at stake. And even with that being the case, I thought it was really important to have another conversation with a family, with a child of one denomination, the father of another. And I really realized that how necessary this in fact was in the aftermath of the shooting in Texas, in a shul in Texas, in congregation Beth Israel in the suburb of Coleyville. I believe that's how you pronounce it. I think I have the information correct. And I was looking at how this was discussed throughout the Jewish community. I mean, to have somebody walk into a place of worship and hold people hostage based on their Jewish identity is something absolutely terrifying. But it was only a few days later that I saw that discourse begin to erode along very sharp and very real ideological differences. And this happens more and more frequently from what I have noticed that even during situations that we should be able to find a place in our hearts to kind of operate as one cohesive family and praying for one another, very often those very real ideological differences, which should never ever be dismissed or minimized, I think they're very important, and there is a forum to discuss it, I hope one day that we're able to discuss them here. But the way that we have begun talking about one another, for me at least, on a personal level, has been deeply upsetting and painful. And I think what might not just upset me, but it almost seems bizarre. It almost seems like, did we forget who we are as a people, as Amcha Yisroel, is the way that we discuss this publicly in front of one another for everyone to see. There was a headline that was published that made note of the fact that this particular congregation, I believe Congregation Beth Israel, which was a reform congregation, and there was a headline from a Orthodox media outlet that made note of his denomination and said, Texas Reform Rabbi held hostage thanks everyone but Hashem after the incident. And my heart sank when I read this. I I didn't interact with it. I didn't talk about it. I didn't bring attention to it online because I I honestly found it so deeply painful. Is this the way that we've begun to talk about one another following a tragedy? And not just talk about one another privately in our own home. Everyone has conversations that maybe they wouldn't broadcast to the world, but we felt comfortable enough, confident enough to broadcast this publicly online. And when I saw this published, I said, we have forgotten something. We have forgotten a certain language of shared communal experience, what Rabbi Soloveitchik once described as the community of fate together. That when we are oppressed, we are oppressed without concerns for your particular individual observance or denomination. 
And the fact that we've lost this language, living in America in exile, to me, is we've lost the very sense of what Amcha Yisrael, of what the Jewish people need to mean for all of us in exile. It does not mean that we need to agree. It does not mean that we cannot have absolutely sharp, very serious debates about ideological concerns, about public policy. It does not mean that we can have very different images of what it means to be a rabbi, of what it means to have a religious community. I think all of those are important and necessary, and those types of debates and disagreements, particularly when they're anchored in substance and history, in text and Torah, that's kept us alive through the exile. that Those are good conversations when they are done in serious ways, in respectful ways, but in passionate ways. We can have those disagreements. What we cannot do is allow those very real ideological divides obscure the fact that we still remain a people. We still remain Amcha Yisroel. And when the only time we talk about the Jewish people, we have in mind more or less people like ourselves, people who grew up like ourselves, maybe who don't affiliate now like ourselves, but ones did, and those are the only people who were able to show that unconditional love for, then that's not really the type of Ahavas Yisroel, the love of the Jewish people that we talk about. Ahavas Yisroel is deliberately difficult, and if you are not able to extend yourself to show love and support, particularly during times of need, that is not the Avas Yisrael that we mourn over our lack of every year on Tisha B'Av. And I believe in many ways that we have lost much of the language that we need that binds us together, the ideas that bind us together, because of our very real ideological differences. Again, which I'm saying for the hundredth time, we're not minimizing. But I think there's a way that we can hold on to both. One of the major complicating factors is the fact that social media and public discourse has become a great deal more public. I think there was a time when leadership was much more measured in the way that they spoke about one another, about their ideological differences, but they were able to kind of come back and foster homes that were still built on a deep, deep sense of Ahavas Yisroel. But now, when anybody can publish something publicly, it's much more easier for our collective discourse to be shaped in much uglier ways and to lose sight of those familial bonds that actually bind us. There is a deeply moving series of responsa from a rabbi named Rabbi Menasha Klein, who was... As far from a, you know, progressive rabbi as you can imagine, I think he was known as the Rav of Ungvar. His responsa were known as Shilos and Chuvos Mishnah Halachos, and he was a very, very conservative, conservative meaning not not the denomination, but his approach to halacha was extraordinarily conservative. And he has a series of responsa where he talks about the notion of Ahavas Yisrael, of loving the Jewish people. And he actually highlights two factors. He says, number one, too often the only thing that we are exposed to publicly are denunciations from one denomination to another, from one leader to another. And when all we're exposed are public denunciations, but not the more intimate familial experiences that go on behind closed doors. So we end up, young people see these public denunciations, but they don't see that inner interior love, that familial bond, the tears that we shed for one another to be close, to still be able to have some collective discourse and connection with one another. They only go out and imitate the negative denunciations that they see publicly. And he says, while those negative denunciations have a very real place, he doesn't criticize them, But he criticizes the fact that it's the only part that we're able to imitate. We're not able to have that foundation of respect. And Rav Menashe Klein had very deep and very real relationships with Jews really across the spectrum. I know he was an old and dear friend to Elie Wiesel. But the second thing he talks about is one of effort that too often we talk about Ahavas Yisroel, the love of the Jewish people, as this abstract concept that we can just say it as a platitude but not put work into. But it's actually extraordinarily difficult, and we put so much work, particularly within the Orthodox community, of putting work of the, what in Yiddish we call harving, like really exerting effort over understanding a Rajba, over understanding a, a passage of Talmud. But do we put the same work into understanding and a appreciating the full spectrum of Klal Yisrael. And the same way that one who grew up in the world of the yeshiva would never walk away from a passage of Talmud and kind of just wave his hand and say, eh, 
makes no sense. I, I don't, it, it's a, th- 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 this is worthless. This isn't important. They would those words would never leave their mouth. But for some reason, very often we can all find ourselves doing that with different segments of the Jewish community. The language that he says, and I'm going to read it in Hebrew, says Ubeezras Hashem Yisbarcha with the help of God, Harbe 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 Kochos a lot. Tremendous, tremendous, tremendous. He repeats it three times. Harbe, meaning a great deal of strength. Hishkadati, I invested. Bemida zu, in this characteristic. Adsha Hashem Yisbarach, until God, Nasan Li, Kitsas Matana, gave me a little bit of a gift. Le'ehov es kol Ishmei Yisrael, to love each and every Jew. And to me, I don't know that we are putting in the right amount of effort. And even though I have no doubt, like it happened last time, and I'm sure it will happen even more this time, there will be people who will criticize these kinds of conversations as validating, as promoting uh, leadership from other denominations. I think we've spent too much time only being exposed to negative language and not enough time being exposed to the familial bonds that underlie them. There's a great piece of advice that one of my closest friends, Akiva, I'd say his last name, I don't have that many friends named Akiva, Akiva Diamond told me that it always stuck with me. I remember exactly where we were. We were on the corner of Lord Avenue and Central Avenue, right across from between the shul that I grew up in and the home that I lived. And he was giving me advice right before I got married. And if you've ever either dispensed advice or received advice before you got married, you know how awful it usually is and how forgettable it usually is. But this has stuck with me all of the years uh, because I think it was such important advice. He said, if you ever get into a fight with your spouse, which is normal, it's part of marriage, you fight, you bicker, real fights, serious fights, whatever it is, don't ever say anything about their family that when they go back to their family, it's going to be irreparable. Don't say anything about your mother-in-law, your father-in-law, their siblings, because at the end of the day, when the fight blows over and the seriousness gets resolved, they're still going to be family. They're still people who you need to show up with at family simchas and this and that. And and again, it's such profound advice and anybody, you know, who's been in a relationship knows how easy it is to escalate. Sometimes you're like, you know what? And you're your family. And then you go off. And then when you're finished and you realize like oh no (laughs) they're still family they're still a part of our lives and now your wife is now going to look at you knowing what you really think about their family what you really have to say about them and I think that this advice which is even if you have very real differences even if you have something to say at the end of the day you have to return back to your family and even when the ideological or serious battles that we wage subside or heal or resolve or even continue at the end of the day there's still a notion of family and I think about this in our collective family of Amcha Yisrael of the entire Jewish people that sometimes we say things to one another that not realizing that at the end of the day we're each returning back to very complex families and the entirety of the Jewish people are here with us, God willing to say, Netzach Yisrael lo Yishakar, the eternity of the Jewish people, is no lie. And for us, when we talk about one another, and we have headlines, whether it's in our media outlets, whether it's what we share publicly online, it's okay to have deep, serious ideological differences. But when we become snarky, when we dunk on each other, when we just kind of undercut one another's communities, and I want to be absolutely clear, I see this too often coming from both sides, coming from the Orthodox world, coming from the non-Orthodox world. This isn't denominational specific. But I think many times the discourse moves away from ideology and just becomes snarky, corrosive, divisive, that we lose our ability to appreciate our shared familial connection. And that is why I am so excited to introduce our conversation with Rabbi Eric Yaffe and his daughter, Dr. Adina Yaffe. Rabbi Eric Yaffe was the former president of the Union for Reform Judaism, and his daughter, Adina, Dr. Adina Yaffe, I actually discovered because she edited the book of my teacher, Rabbi Dr. Ari Bergman, called The Formation of the Talmud, Scholarship and Politics in Yitzchak Isaac Halevi's Dorot HaRishonim. Aside from the fact that Adina, who still remains obviously close to her father, but forged a different path in her own religious life on a personal level, but what I really found fascinating was her role in editing this book. Because what the book is about, aside from the formation of the Talmud, is really about the formation of Agudas Yisroel, the umbrella 
umbrella organization for much of the right-wing Orthodox world. And Rabbi Yitzchak Isaac Halevi had a foundational role in the founding of Aguda. And I found it so fascinating that in her own experience growing up, not only in a reform home, but so to speak in the reform home with the head of the Union of Reform Judaism as her father, she went on afterwards after forging her own path to be an editor about the founding of the Orthodox umbrella organization, the founding of Agudas Yisroel. And their journey as a family in remaining connected to each other, even through very real ideological differences, I think is a model and a template for how we can consider our own connections to people of different denominations, even when there are very serious ideological differences. It's easy to love completely unaffiliated Jews who don't have an ideology of their own. But what's difficult and where you need to have, in the words of Rav Menashe Klein, harbe, harbe, harbe kochos, a lot of energy, a lot of capacity, a lot of strength, to really build and contain the multitudes that Am Yisrael, that the Jewish people contain, is in order to love people who have very different, sharply different ideological positions than your own. And I think this is a model of what we need in our time to be able to have ideological differences, but not erode our familial connections of the Jewish people. So it is my absolute pleasure to introduce our conversation with Rabbi Eric Yaffe and his daughter, Dr. Adina Yaffe. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome the Yaffe's. Rabbi Eric Yaffe was the is now the president emeritus of the Union for Reform Judaism. I think I, I have that body. Did I say that name correctly? Yes, you did. And Dr. Adina Yaffe is an editor, a writer. She is a recovering academic. I think that's the way that you describe it in many ways. You worked on a book that maybe we may even touch upon by one of my teachers, uh, Ari Bergman, about the formation of the Talmud, which I found absolutely fascinating and how I first discovered your work. Thank you both for joining us today. Happy to be with you. Yes. So I wanted to begin with the story of Adina, and I apologize. You have a PhD. Is it okay? Are you comfortable if I call you Adina rather than oh, Dr. Oh, Yaffe? Oh, sure, sure, sure. Yes, absolutely. I must know. Just for the flow of the conversation, I hope that's okay. But I do want to acknowledge uh, you, you, you went to school for long enough and you've certainly earned it. Adina, you grew up in not just a reform household, but almost the reform household. Your father was the leader of a movement. And at a certain point, uh, you found yourself affiliating with synagogues, with communities that were outside of that movement. Can you take us through how that process began from your eyes? Sure. I mean, one thing to note, which is, I think, a slightly different angle on what you said, David, about the home that I grew up in, is that it was not a typical reform home. And not only because my father was the head of the movement, which, I mean, he became that when I was in high school. So it wasn't actually my whole childhood, but also because... So my mother, Zichronali Vrecha, who passed away about two years ago, sorry, she had grown up in a 1950s conservative home, which uh, her father was pretty traditional. Um, she went to public school, but to, you know, five day a week Hebrew school, Jewish camp in the summer, you know, that kind of thing. And so she had brought my father to Kashrut and to various other things. So our home was quite traditional in the sense that, you know, we celebrated all the holidays. We had a sukkah, lulav etrogan sukkot. We kept Pesach, we had two, you know, two sets of dishes and all that sort of thing. And then we also had, you know, my brother and I both went to a Schechter school that was near our house initially, and then it was for, the high school was further away. And we had a huge amount of Hebrew. My father has always had a great love of Hebrew and Israel. And so it was not a typical, it wasn't even a typical conservative home. I was actually sort of amused by the fact that some of the conservative kids I went to school with had imbibed a certain negative attitude of the reform movement, but we were virtually always more observant than they were. And so that was one thing. And then the other thing is that I really had, you know, they talk about the God bug or the God gene. I really sort of always had a great love of Judaism. And I, you know, I talked about this with my brother who was four years younger. His name is Adam. We had the same parents. We went to the same school. You know, we went to all the same holiday celebrations and he never had, you know, the sort of great passion for the sort of the ritual elements, the Torah elements that I did, although he is, you know, He's a reformed Jew. He loves Israel. He speaks Hebrew like he's not 
estranged from the faith or anything, but he never had that sort of thing in his kishkas exactly the way that I did. And so I think it started in in both of those places. And then it also, I, for a long time, I did regular Torah study with my father. I actually, I say it started in third grade because I had mononucleosis, which is unusual for a child to have. And I was out of school for like Uh, three weeks. And the school said to, to my father, like, look, the only thing we're majorly doing skills development on this particular month is Tanakh. And can you like go over X, Y, Z with Adina so she's not behind when she comes back? And that sort of I date as like the beginning of our studying of Torah together. And then so certainly while I was in high school, we studied Torah virtually every Shabbat. We studied the Parsha with commentaries or whatever. And that was something that I always really, really enjoyed. Can I jump in for a second? I want to hear uh, and ask a question of your father. Do you agree with the characterization? Did you know from a young age that Adina, so to speak, had the God bug? Is that how you would have described her as a father? Yes, I don't think I would have used those words exactly. (laughs) But it's certainly true that she had an interest in prayer. She had an interest in God. She had an interest in tradition. You know, it was a a search. It was a, a struggle. We debated it. But, you know, she brought a certain set of commitments to these matters. She was, she was a daviner. She was a believer in a way that uh, my, my son was not. He's committed to Judaism in other ways, as, as Adina said. But uh, he didn't have the comfort with, with prayer, the immersion in prayer that, that she had. So she was on this religious journey. I can't take credit for that. We'll get to the rest of the journey. I'm just, I love when a parent sees their child embrace something. You know, I have this with myself, my son. I wasn't ever super into music and uh, kumzits and, you know, everybody sitting around. And my son, we realized from the age of three already that he just, he's connected to music in a way that we never, and we built around it. And I'm just curious to hear from you before we return to Adina's story. Did you at any point, and really like what age was it that you kind of was wondering in the back of your head like wow she this young girl may need like a different structure or different programming than what we were initially intending and i don't think so for the reasons that adina indicated in other words we had an intensely jewish home yeah (laughs) so you know having said that uh, i think she was uh, in a way in exactly the right place to explore those things you know that were so important to her and in her religious search and and her efforts to embrace torah you know the school was particularly important sure you know we were uh, committed to jewish education with jewish nursery schools jewish camps but for adina the school was particularly important it wasn't a, a reform uh, day school if it had been a reform day school in the area we probably would have started by looking at that but there was wasn't. But we sent her to a, a school that was a serious school, and she thrived there. She had teachers there who inspired her. So my own sense was, all right, she has these interests, and she's in a place where she can explore them and develop them. So, Adina, take me back to your story. At what point did you almost test the waters with a community, with a synagogue that was outside of the reform or conservative community that you had institutional connections to? You were in a shechter for schooling. You had a home that was a very convicted, very traditional uh, reform, conservative type home. What was almost the thinking? And at what point did you say, I want to test the water in some place else? How did that come about? Right. So it came about to some extent by accident, because when I was in elementary school, I had a friend who came to school, my school for only one year, and then moved away again. Her family initially moved a lot. And she and I became friends and we stayed friends. We went to each other's bat mitzvahs and whatever. And then when she was in middle school, late middle school, she started to become from. Okay. And then when she was in high school, she really started to become from. And she was very active in NCSY in New Jersey. She lived in Southern New Jersey in Cherry Hill. And we live in central and sort of North Central New Jersey. And it was like an hour and a half away or something. And I didn't drive until I almost was graduated from high school because I was a little young for my grade. And so the question is, how could we see each other as much as possible? And so sometimes there were NCSY Shabbatons, not too far from my house in our house in Livingston, which is not too far from my Schechter. And so I realized if I went to these Shabbatons, we could see each other and we didn't have to inconvenience our parents and whatever. So I started, I went to a couple of NCSY Shabbatons. I also met a few friends of hers and I was incredibly impressed 
by, you know, the sort of what I guess we would call the Hamishness, the warmth, the devotion that I saw at these Shabbatons. And I also had a little bit of practice, I guess I would say, in observing Shabbat, which I had never done. So that was certainly one component of it. Also, I would say my father mentioned teachers that inspired me. My Talmud teacher for most of high school um, was a man named Hirsch Jacobson. We call all called, he told us to call him Mr. Jacobson, although he had smicha. And he was, he might have called himself conservative, but he was like, it was like a 19, like totally Shomer Shabbos, you know, sure, like sure. kind of thing. And he was just a very inspiring person. I'd say he was sort of like my mashkiach ruchani, if you will. I'm just so curious. I, I want to come back. I have so many questions, but I, I was so touched. He asked you to call him Mr. Jacobson. It's funny. My grandfather was a student of somebody who, who asked to be called Mr. Mendelovich and is sometimes affectionately known as Reb Shraga Feivel Mendelovich, who started the Torah Masora school network system. Do you know why he asked to be called Mr. Jacobson rather than Rabbi Jacobson? I don't 100% know. My, and my father actually may know better because he was the head of school when I started and then he transitioned to another role and did more teaching. And I think my father probably knows more about him than, than I do. I don't actually know. But one thing that he did for our Talmud class is he, he did a Shabbaton at our school. Our school did not have Shabbatons. Most of the kids, um, you know, very, very few of the kids were Shomer Shabbos at home. I don't consider this to be a deficit. It just sort of was what it was. And for just... The sort of two Talmud classes that he taught, we had a Shabbaton at the school, nobody else there. And, you know, Davin learned and like we did all this stuff. And it was another situation where I had sort of practice observing Shabbat and I found it incredibly meaningful. So those were the two things that happened when I was in high school. Then when I was finishing up high school, I sort of had the sense that I wanted to try the Shabbat thing longer term. I don't want to just do it a weekend here, a weekend there. And I saw it very much as an outgrowth of my the Torah study with my father, because if you read the Torah a lot, you're like, well, this Shabbat thing gets mentioned a lot. You know, this very sense that this was sort of central to what the Torah was saying. So I was already planning to take a gap year between high school and college. And I lived at home and I did two things. I worked at a bookstore and I audited classes at JTS. I just commuted in twice a week to do that. And on Shabbat, I started going to the Chabad that had opened up not so long ago in my hometown. My parents' synagogue was three and a half miles from our house. And Chabad was one mile from our house. So it wasn't really hard to decide which to walk to. So that was the first time that I sort of started going regularly to a shul. So if I could just pause at this point in the story and kind of bring in your father. So I'm curious, Adina has this friend who's going to NCSY Shabbatons. I assume you you had known what NCSY was. What was your initial reaction that you had a daughter who wanted to go to an NCSY Shabbaton? I don't think that my initial reaction, you know, was negative in any any sense. I mean, the broader question is, as she developed in the these commitments that she has been talking about and started moving in a particular direction, I mean, if the question is, you know, did I have certain concerns? Uh, and, and the answer is yes, up to a point. For sure. It wasn't uh, something that distressed me greatly. She was, you know, clearly taking a path somewhat different from from my uh, path. But it wasn't. Uh, look, you know, I'm I'm aware of certain families in which uh, somebody starts uh, moving in this direction, and the you know the parents' response is, "This is just nonsense." You know, this I don't understand any of this. It's nonsense. It's threatening to me. I mean, that clearly was not my reality. Sure. And uh, along the way, I gave some thought to, well, what would happen if she were to become fully orthodox? And, you know, what would be some of the implications of that? So was there a thought process whereby I dealt with those issues? And the answer is yes, there was. But uh, I was, you know, was never, uh, you know, uh, I I think for reasons perhaps are clear from what we've already said, somebody who's greatly distressed by this. And I also operated on an assumption that whatever point uh, on a religious spectrum where she would end up, it would not be extreme and fanatic. Mm -hmm. That was was my assumption, although obviously one could not be completely uh, sure. My, My wife's brother... Uh, I have to be careful what I say here because I mean he's a dear friend and a, and a you know wonderful wonderful guy. And... But he's more devout. 
in that way. Well, he's more orthodox in, in a completely reasonable way, but she told the story of how during his high school years, he became what she defined as very extreme. Okay. And how distraught her parents were. And I suspect that in the back of her mind, that example was there for her to worry about some. And I hadn't gone through that. I hadn't experienced it. So I reacted somewhat differently. But it wasn't entirely out of my consciousness either. So a set of concerns, but no, uh, no panic or deep distress. And, you know, basically sort of a willingness to see how this played out. And we look, we talked about this along the way. Again, I didn't, you know, mention that, you know, we studied Torah. So in, you know, during the Torah study or on other occasions as well, it wasn't as if we wouldn't talk about these issues. We would talk about these issues. Mm -hmm. And so it was an ongoing conversation. And I, you know, my emphasis was different from hers. You know, I, I would talk about change in choice. And she would talk about uh, standards in a sense of permanence. And I would talk about, uh, you know, a Judaism of mitzvah. And she would talk about a Judaism of halakha. Fascinating. And so, you know, we, we would have those discussions. And, and look, early on, even though I, I was obviously the senior member in the sense that I was <laughs> the parent, you know, you, you, you know, get the sense that the key is to sort of stress the authenticity of your own convictions and not to dwell on the shortcomings of somebody else's or the errors of somebody else's. So, you know, you, you try and, you know, have uh, uh, discussions uh, with that in mind. And by and large, we did. There's something deeply universal about these stories. I, my family has a similar makeup. My father grew up in North Adams, Massachusetts, and came from what was a 1950s Orthodox home, which is closer, probably more of a conservative home. There was only an Orthodox school when he was growing up. And he decided to go to Yeshiva University. My uncle did not go. And they really, the, the families, and we're, we're so incredibly close, the families took very, very different directions. And my cousins and ourselves, we're still close, but to say that there aren't, you know, concerns in one or the other, this is the normal growth of families and the way that you were able to stay together, I think is the example that we really want to highlight and that I find so incredibly moving. If I could just speak a little bit at this like initial transition, what do you think your biggest concern was. Again, extremism is its a very broad term, and it's also something that all high school students are, are prone to. I, I'm always there. Any high school student, even in NCSY, you're always nervous that they're going to get caught by some extremism <laughs> in one way or the other. But were there specific kind of like touch points of tension that were concerning? And almost as a praise that both of you could say, how do you think you both handled it? Give me an example of how, how you handled it well, like how you navigated this in a healthy way. So, I mean, and I've been thinking about this a little bit because of my earlier conversation with David. Um, so one of the concerns that my parents had was that it would be, this would be a problem. This journey would be a problem from the perspective of my extended family. So we would spend holidays with uh, my grandparents, with my aunts and uncles. I had one set of grandparents lived 45 minutes away from the other set in Massachusetts. And so we would often like go for one day of Rosh Hashanah to one and one day of Rosh Hashanah to another, you know, to another. I have to ask where in Massachusetts, in the Berkshires or in? No, one in, one set are in the in the Boston area, one set in Worcester. Okay. And then, you know, one Seder with one, one Seder with the other, that kind of thing. So that this would disrupt that. And this was a major part of our family lives. So what I did basically was I just, I just compromised. I mean, in other words, I continued to ride, you know, from one place to the other on Yom Tov until my grandparents, till my last grandparent passed away in 2008, by which time I was almost 30. The only time I was concerned about the food um, was on Pesach. When I was in, in high school, I did start to bring my own food to my father's side of the family. My mother's side of the family kept Pesach well enough for me because they didn't change their dishes and so forth. That didn't go over hugely well, but everybody kept it together. And my, my grandmother, my father's mother, was a, a source of support to me in this time, even though she did not understand what was happening. How did she provide that support? I'm just curious. I mean, she could have gone completely crazy. And, it, you know, she, I mean, like the family was not, she had grown up in actually a sort of traditional, but not terribly religious family, but it was a reform family in Worcester, Massachusetts. Like, I'm going to bring my own, I'm going to eat matzah and cream cheese on paper plates at your house on Pesach was not the kind of thing that they 
had any experience with, you know, I mean, and so I had a very close relationship with my grandmother, basically my whole life. And she made this work for her, which is something for which I have great admiration. So from my perspective, even though I'm sure that there were some tense moments with the extended family, I just said, look, I'm not, I'm not going to make an issue out of this because I'm not going to blow this whole thing apart. And what about you? Were those concerns was the Shabbos and Yuntif, like the, the travel, was that the major concern? Was the major concern just the, the the mystery of how far this will go? What do you think was exacerbating? And how, from your own experience, do you think Adina handled these points of tension or difference? Broadly speaking, you know, what, what worries you in this situation? I'm speaking for myself now. I don't want to generalize. But, you know, there, there are issues of principle and then there are issues of practicality. You know, and, and maybe as, as a rabbi, the issues of principle, you know, I don't know how, how much that might apply in a general sense. But in, in any case, so the practical issues are the ones that Adina, uh, you know, mentioned. You, you worry, is her observance going to disrupt our family life in such a way so that we're not going to be able to have family gatherings, celebrate holidays together and so on, which is tremendously important to us as a family, exceedingly important to my wife and both my parents and my, my in-laws. So the issue of kashrut on the one hand and, you know, Shabbat and holidays, which of course is fundamental mental to, to uh, orthodox observance, might they play out in such a way that our family would be torn apart? I mean, I know you've discussed this on previous shows. And so th- those practical concerns are potentially real. And I'm, you know, aware of families where, in fact, that is exactly what happened. So was I worried about it? Yes. Uh, was my wife worried about it? Yes. But, you know, I think Adina has described her approach. She was anxious to keep the family together. She was true to her beliefs, but was pre- prepared in the interests of Shalom Bayat to bring a certain flexibility to her halakhic practice so that the family could uh, stay together. You know, there, there might be a particular case where we had tensions. My wife grew up in a kosher home. She's very proud of her kashra sure. and took it seriously. Uh, when I was in rabbinical school, she taught reform rabbinical students how to keep kosher <laughs> because uh, she was experienced and, and uh, knew how to do it and, and so on and so forth. Was it a problem for her that Adina at certain points did not accept her approach to kashrut and was more stringent in her own observance? And the answer is yes. It upset her. It upset her. Having said that, uh, did they work it out? And the answer is yes, they worked it out in a way that they could, you know, both uh, live with. So, you know, those are the practical issues. The, you know, the principles are a different matter. I don't know if you want to discuss that now or not, but look, there were certain things that certainly worried, worried me to some extent, my wife as well. I mean, uh, the equality of women. It's a central defining characteristic of reform uh, approach to tradition. And it was also exceedingly important to my wife, both as a religious principle and as, as a general principle. So, you know, one worry is how is that going to play out? And, you know, are we going to be uncomfortable with a daughter who in some ways is putting aside this value that is so important to us, both in, Jew- in, in Jewish terms and in broader societal and secular terms? There's an issue of social justice, which, again, central to my understanding of Judaism, important in my life, very important to my wife. You know, uh, there are elements of of the Orthodox community for whom this tends to be more incidental and more marginal and, and, you know, not central to their understanding of tradition. I'm happy you brought up, I'm sorry to jump in, but I'm only interrupting you with your, uh, really with your own words. I actually remember, and I, I looked up and printed out an article that you wrote on social justice, which I actually found quite moving. And what I found so beautiful about it is that in this article, which was a response to a very old debate that I, I think most people may not remember, but still plays out in many ways in our community between a, uh, a furniture magnate named Joel Alperson, and you wouldn't even believe me if I told you how I was connected to Joel Alperson. He flew me out to run a Yom Kippur service for the community of the Corn Huskers because their opening game fell out on Yom Kippur, and he flew me out to run a service. It's a story for a different time and one I hope I get to share, but you quoted Adina at the end of your article, and I actually 
I absolutely love the quote and I love the position you took where you quote, and I'm just going to share it because I found it to be so beautiful. We don't observe Shabbos because it is a sandbag against assimilation, she said, you quoting your own daughter, Adina, but because it is a part of the eternal covenant between God and the Jews that evokes the miracle of creation and the exodus from Egypt, links me to Jews throughout the centuries. And you said, exactly so. And your response was, and I think this is entirely reasonable, that people who say it only can only be one and not the other, we can't have it both ways, you say, in fact, we must. To do one without the other is to retreat from the world and distort Judaism's very essence, which I absolutely agree with. But I'm actually, I don't want to litigate specific principles. What I actually would curious to hear Adina on is the distinction your father made between practicality and principles. Which of those did you have an easier time navigating and how, in fact, were you able to articulate and discuss differences of principles without, I'm not trying to find what the right word is, I don't think the right word is demonizing, without making your own family feeling illegitimate. How do you take a principled stand without making someone within your own family feeling like their own lives and their own practice does not have any, you know, standing in your eyes, which I assume you didn't feel emotionally, but how do you have principled debates among family? Would you just tell people, avoid them altogether? It's what a lot of people would say. It's probably... Might be the advice I would give. I'm curious how those conversations around principles, uh, what advice and how did you navigate them? I mean, I guess the first thing I would say is I had the distinct advantage, as you alluded to, of being a teenager when most <laughs> of this was going on. So the level of sort of shame that I had or didn't have and confidence that I had or didn't have is not what I would describe as existing even when I was in my mid-20s. So... I mean, initially there was a lot of sort of, well, I'm right and you're wrong. And the great unearned confidence of our teenage years. What right. a wonderful right. time to be alive. I mean, I, I, I did have, I mean, dad uh, alluded to this briefly before. Dad and I did have conversations. And I, I think, look, we were a household where we debated a lot of things. You know, my, my brother is an attorney. I thought I might be an attorney. You know, around the dinner table was a place where we debated politics. We debated education. We talked about Israel. So the idea that, you know, we couldn't have a conversation about a controversial issue just never would have occurred to me or to anyone else in our immediate family. So and with my father in particular, we tended to have a lot of these sort of conversations, arguments, debates, whatever you want to call them. And for this had been for a lot of my life, it just sort of changed slightly the degree. But my sort of statements that there has to be like, there has to be a final answer, there has to be a right answer, there has to be a standard. And, you know, I understand that you love mitzvot, but like you pick this mitzvah and I pick that mitzvah, like it, how can you have a community like that? How can you have, you know, a religion like that? There just have to be minimum standards that everybody follows was a, a sense I had kind of for my whole life, but really crystallized for me in my teenage years when I was on this journey. And, you know, then my father would, would sort of talk about why he didn't think that was necessarily the case. And I, I mean, I remember those conversations as not being any more contentious than, you know, some political conversations we had or some Israel related conversations that we had. I think, you know, with my mother, as my father pointed out, the, the practical issues were more of an issue. And I didn't, of course, I didn't want to make her feel like her home wasn't kosher in some sort of absolute sense. But there were certain situations. So, I mean, my parents kept what in the conservative movement they call kosher by ingredient. So, I mean, kosher meat, of course, from a kosher butcher and like all that kind of stuff. But Which is, you know, was the state of most of kosher, you know, in the 1950s. It was yes, certainly yes. the kosher that my Bubby and Zadie. The way my mother had grown up keeping kosher. Yeah. And so there came a time in which, for example, after I ate meat or while I was eating meat, I would not eat anything processed with it that was not marked as parv. So she would like buy a can of chickpeas to have with the chicken. And I would say, I'm not eating the chickpeas with the chicken because they're not half shirt and just find me a can of OU chickpeas and I'll eat those instead. And, you know, those kinds of things. She wasn't thrilled with that initially. And so it was it was very much that sort of practical stuff. And one thing she would often say to me is, but grandpa, meaning her father, grandpa who would eat that. And he uh -huh. was actually pretty traditional. And I remember one time she said to me, but grandpa ate swordfish. Oh, the great swordfish debate. That's a... Uh... When I explained to her that actually the same Talmud teacher had told us in our Talmud class about what was it Rav Tendler? Somebody had said about how 
they had done a scientific examination of swordfish and those weren't really scales and whatever. And she would say, well, grandpa ate swordfish. So she very much saw this much as a much sure. more mimetic, what Sal- Chaim Salvejic would call mimetic. A past guest on the 1840 podcast, allow me to say. Great. Just to our listeners who don't know about the great swordfish debate of American Jewish history, this was a very contentious issue and I would recommend the book Kosher USA, How Coke Became Kosher and Other Tales of Modern Food by Roger Horowitz, which is a lovely tale that goes through some of the swordfish debate. It was not an open-shut case, and definitely there was a mimetic tradition of Jews who were eating swordfish in those very uh, early years and was uh, was certainly a major debate, but that's fascinating that that came out in your house. I, I don't know people who, who eat sword. I don't know that it's sold so popularly. Is it? Is that a popular dish? Swordfish? Yeah, I mean, people do eat it. Like, I mean, you can buy it in a restaurant. I mean, you can get it in a restaurant. I don't know if people buy it at fish store. I, I really don't know. I mean, I've never ate swordfish, but I'm excited by it because as a child, it was my absolute favorite fish because it's such a cool looking fish. So, uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt, but please keep going with that brief uh, swordfish tangent. I mean, right. So, I mean, in other words, with my mother, it was mainly the practical issues. You know, we managed to work it out. I think it's interesting. I, my father mentioned this thing about my uncle. So I knew that he had been quite from in his teenage years and that my grandfather hadn't liked it and stuff like that, but that, you know, he, he became modern Orthodox and, you know, he's modern Orthodox today and, you know, everything's all fine. And I liked being able to go to Seder at his house during the time, you know, that I was going to the other state. So I knew about that intellectually, but I, I guess I didn't realize, you know, to the extent that it was driving my mother's concern about some of this, but it's totally understandable in retrospect. I think I knew about the feminism angle. My mother was a proud feminist, both Jewishly and sort of in her regular American life. I'd say she maybe also taught some reform rabbinical students how to be American feminists while she was also teaching them how to keep kosher. So I knew that was a problem with her. And I always, the only thing is I thought that it was a possibility that I might end up in a community that was conservative, egalitarian, but also Shomer Shabbos. I think I thought to some extent that that issue might go away. Uh Uh-huh. Uh Uh-huh. Fascinating. So let me turn the pages and talk about, you know, a lot of the initial journey took place before your father was such a public figure. Eventually, you became a public figure. You were the head in many ways of the reform movement, the Union of Reform Synagogues. And some of the changes were discussed in public spaces. And I want to I want to contrast an early quote that you had in the book, The Rebbe's Army by by Sue Fishkoff, where you talk about it, and contrast it to a later reflection that you wrote on your website about Adina. And I want to discuss how you have changed from that initial assessment to where Adina is now. And I want to read it now because I think I think particularly the second quote is quite moving and quite beautiful. But in The Rebbe's Army, Sue Fishkoff quotes you as follows, where you're discussing uh, Adina's participation in a Chabad congregation, a Chabad synagogue, And you wrote, and she, of course, cannot participate, talking about Adina sitting and not being able to read from the Torah and participate, as is the standard in most Orthodox synagogues. So apart from the fact that she may be doing all this just to aggravate me, in the final analysis, this isn't a Judaism that she or the majority of American Jews is going to buy. Now, she was much younger. This book came out in 2003. Many years later, you reflected on Adina and wrote as follows. Do I regret her religious choices? Absolutely not. She has chosen a path that I would not choose, but it is a worthy path. We continue our discussions with her both vigorous and loving. And every time we do so, I think about the need to respect religious approaches other than my own. This is a subject on which I need reminding from time to time. I am a combative person. I see myself as a defender of Reform Judaism. I am quick to offer a fierce defense of my liberal principles. But sitting across from my daughter and knowing the thoughtfulness of her convictions. It is a respect that I feel and express, and I remind myself to stress the authenticity of my beliefs rather than what I may see as the shortcomings of hers. Sometimes we talk about choice. Growing up in our home, it seems to me that she felt crazy sometimes from too much choice. I, on the other hand, welcome choice. I need it, rejoice in it, and thrive on it. 
to me, these are not drastically, but two different perspectives. It seems to me like the first perspective was looking at Adina's journey as more of a phase that would not hold. And you reflecting many years later now appreciate that there is a difference. There was an evolution that there is now a very real change that is more long term. I'm curious, reflecting on these two perspectives, if you agree that they are in fact different, how do you think you have changed? And how do you think it it maybe reoriented the way you look at her conviction and more largely other people's convictions? I think that, look, I I don't know how much I, I view those two quotes as being terribly different. Yeah, they're certainly not like different universes. <laughs> right. <laughs> but there's certainly a different emphasis there. You know, it reflects the fact that it reflects a number of things. It reflects a number Tell of things. Tell me. First of all, I was older the sec- <laughs> second <laughs> for the second quote. I'd had more experience as a father. I had thought more about, you know, the responsibility that I had to nurture my daughter and her religious choices. The first quotation was made as sort of in an ideological context. Yes. And that's the way the question was asked. And I mean, I know I knew Sue before, you know, she wrote the book. So there's a difference between ideological debates and the responsibilities of fatherhood and family. So that's one aspect. You know, another aspect that I think is important here and, you know, somewhat sensitive, but you've asked the question. So, you know, let me let me answer it. Honestly, Adina and I have found a way to, to live with our differences and not only live with them, but, you know, to, to respect each other. But, you know, that that's exactly the point that m- makes this work for us as individuals and for us as a family. You know, it's one thing to say that I'm here and for her to say that I'm here. But I think both of us understand the legitimacy of, uh, you know, each other's religious choices. And the truth is, that's not always the way that it works. It just isn't the way that it works. I mean, I, I, I know that much more from the Israeli experience than from the American experience, because the truth is, in the American experience, uh, Reform and Orthodox leaders don't, you know, don't talk very much. And it's not like in, you know, in Israel, they, they talk very much either. On the other hand, when I, when I went to Israel representing the Reform movement, I would be actively engaged in religious debates. And either directly with people or with those who would speak for people and who would make it very clear, not only that they disagreed with me, but fundamentally they saw that what I was doing and what I was believing in the, in the movement that I represented were illegitimate you know, in the eyes of the Jewish tradition. That makes this a much more fraught and sure. difficult and problematic religious exchange you know it's it's one thing to disagree about torah it's another another thing to say that that your approach to torah is totally illegitimate adina and i have avoided that and you know generally speaking you know it would be best if our community as a whole could see some element of legitimacy in those in the other camp at the same time while holding on to their own beliefs and convictions we don't do that terribly well. I mean, I, you know, I, look, I'm, I, I was always inspired by um, Rabbi Yitz Greenberg, who, you know, would often talk about these matters that he dealt with, uh, has, you know, dealt with throughout his life. He would always say, I don't care what religious stream, what movement you're a part of, as long as you're ashamed of it. <laughs> and I always, I would mention that to Adina with some frequency. Mm-hmm. I'm a combative person. I believe what I believe. I'm not shy about it. I make the argument. I'm an advocate. Sure. At the same time, I bring a certain humility, I hope, to my approach to Judaism and and my movement's approach to Judaism, and I'm quick to acknowledge our weaknesses, our frailties, our potential errors. That's always the key. That's always the key. And what do you think, looking at the life and the choices of Adina, do you look at the frailty or, or the, the relative strengths differently? Meaning, what did it uncover for you? Do you approach that differently now? or Look, I, I, you know, Adina pointed to certain things in our movement that are problematic. And it's not that I didn't know them before, but, you know, did she help me focus in on them? Yes. Uh, she did. I mean, other things did did as well. But I mean, she, for example, she's, you know, uh, indirectly at least uh, suggested this. You know, I belong to a wonderful synagogue and I belonged to it for a long time. I wasn't, usually wasn't there because I was traveling all over the country for sure. most of my professional life. But having, having said that, 
you know, it's uh, the worship there, the davening there was not always as meaningful as it needed to be. And often it wasn't meaningful at all for young people. And that was a reality. I mean, not only was I, uh, you know, conscious of it at a certain level, but I saw how it played out in her life. And it made it that much more uh, dramatic for me. And it became a focus of my own uh, tenure as president at the union in that worship reform became a, a major focus of my work. And not not once, but twice at our great biennial conventions where we'd come together five or 6,000 people and I would try and define the agenda. Twice I, I focused on these issues because I understood that she was right. I understood wow. that she was right. Beautiful. Before we wind down with our more rapid fire questions, I wanted to ask Adina a little bit of a specific question, unless she wanted to respond to something specifically that you said. But Adina, I'm curious specifically, and you'll forgive me, I'm kind of like a standing now, which is the verb that millennials use when they are awestruck and excited by somebody else's work. I'm absolutely fascinated by the works, particularly in light of your own journey that you did on. Ari Bergman's book, which is about the formation of the Talmud, specifically the work of Rabbi Yitzchak Halevi, the author of the Doros Harishonim, but particularly the founder of Agudas Yisroel, which is kind of the right-wing umbrella organization that still exists today. And I'm curious if when you were working on this book, I know you worked on it with Ari, it was Ari's dissertation that you helped adapt into a book that was published by De Gruyter. Did your work on looking at the influence infrastructure and the founding of Agudas Yisroel, which is a more right-wing Orthodox organization. Did you ever kind of reflect on your own life and your own experiences in denominational disagreement through the lens of this foundational work that you must have spent countless hours, if not years, months certainly, uh, working on? Uh, did it? Did you ever look into it and kind of reflect back on the world that you grew up in, you know, have being pre- privy to some of these large denominational battles, and here you are working on a book that in many ways crystallized the central institutional umbrella organization for orthodoxy. Sure. I think, I mean, I, I spent about a year working with Ari on the book. It was a great experience, and I think what he's done to bring um, Rabbi Halevi's scholarship to the general public is really great. I think the thing that really struck me the most, to be honest, when working on the section about the Aguda is, you know, they were all, all the various factions, the various Ravs, you know, who were in Katowice, 1912, trying to hammer this all out. We're really asking some version of the question, what is orthodoxy going to look like in modernity? And that for me is something that I think about. I think about myself as a modern person. I go to Davin Amon Orthodox Shul. And, you know, one of the reasons why I Davin at this shul is because it is a shul that is, you know, a place that I think really shows what orthodoxy, what modern orthodoxy can be, what orthodoxy can look like in modernity. You know, it's a shul that is diverse in terms of it has a, a reasonably sized population of converts. It has non-white Jews. It is a place that is very welcoming to people, regardless of what they wear, regardless of how much money they have, um, regardless of their upbringing. And many, many people there have grown up in non-Orthodox homes. Um, most people there have grown up in conservative homes, I would say, more likely. But these are not these are not necessarily older people who grew up 1950s conservative, like many of the people my age grew up in conservative homes. And so this this sort of op this openness, this diversity, this this Hamishness combined with Torah, mitzvot, Shabbat, Kashrut, Jewish education, Zionism. This is, I think, what orthodoxy can look like in modernity. And for me, that's very meaningful. So I think that those were sort of the thoughts that I had about, you know, that that arose in my mind from working on, on the book with R. Just kind of portending and that looking out into the future and, and wondering how is this movement? And I think ha not just it wasn't just a movement question. How are the Jewish people going to survive under the winds of modernity, which is obviously a central theme of everything that we do on 1840, which is why I am so grateful to both of you for sharing this story. I always end our conversations with more rapid fire questions, and I'm going to do something a little bit unusual for one of them. My opening question is always for a book recommendation. I'm wondering if each of you could recommend a book from 
a denomination other than the current affiliation, synagogue affiliation that you belong to. Can you recommend a book, maybe Adina, that you read growing up that you think would be of value, of relevance, of importance from outside of kind of what you would typically be exposed to within uh, the Orthodox community? And Rabbi Yaffe, could you recommend a book that was written by an author that is from outside the Reform Movement, from a different denomination? I think for the exercise, it would be more fun if it's from the Orthodox denomination, something that you found inspiring and interesting. I very much, when I was growing up, heard from my father about Rabbi Dr. Arthur Hertzberg. And my father actually gave me some books he wrote as, a, as an academic, like the French Enlightenment and Jews. But his book, The Fate of Zionism, was a book that I read when I was growing up that I found to be very meaningful. And because Rabbi Hertzberg was shall we say, slightly polemical. I don't, I don't know how much it's read, certainly in Orthodox circles, but I, I think it's potentially very helpful and instructive, even if somewhat polemical. Okay, that is a fantastic recommendation. Yeshiyahu Leibowitz was a huge influence on me, and Yahudut Am Yehudit of Medinat Yisrael is a sort of his central work, which exists in, in English for those who aren't Hebrew readers. I don't remember its exact English <laughs> title. Judaism. Uh, I mean, I don't know if it's they translated. Judaism, human and values in the Jewish state. That's it. So, I mean, I've, I've read, you know, many of his books, but if you want to talk about an Orthodox figure, obviously he's gone now, although he didn't die all that many years ago. He has a fascinating, in some ways extreme, uh, and a very different approach to Orthodox as a, a tradition. He's deeply and profoundly Orthodox in every sense, although he has a you know a radical way about him, and we can't get into into that now. But any of his books, I cannot think. You know, my second question is: if you had, and this is always tricky because I believe Adina, we we mentioned already has one. I'm not sure if you as well. But if somebody gave you a great deal of money and allowed you to take a sabbatical for as long as you needed to go back to school and get another PhD, what? What topic and title do you think that dissertation would be about? Gosh. <laughs> this might be a triggering question for somebody who already went to school and knows how difficult it is. No, I mean, I guess what I would say is I, I studied general history for my PhD. Um, when I was in shul, when the people found out I was doing a history PhD, the first question they would always ask was Jewish or regular? <laughs> that was invariably the question in those exact words. Um, and I would say regular. So I think I would want the opportunity to pursue a PhD in Jewish history, maybe perhaps even from the same period, early modern history. Some of the editing, academic editing work I do is in early modern Jewish history, and it seems so fascinating. So I would definitely like to learn more about it. That's a great topic. And shout out to Adina's editing services for any of our listeners <laughs> who are looking for a top of the line editor, writer. You could check out her website, which we, of course, will link to. Uh, she really does incredible work. I know it because one of my favorite books was a product of much of her work. If you had a great deal of money and could go back to school to get a PhD, what do you think the topic and title would be? First of all, I'm, I'm too old to do PhDs, so <laughs> that's not even an issue for me. But if I were going to immerse myself in serious study now, in addition, I mean, as, as a rabbi, one studies all kinds of things, all sorts, of, you know, sure. uh, all the time, one hopes. But look, I, I'd study Yiddish language and literature. I, in college, was fortunate enough to be able to study Yiddish a little bit. One of the regrets of my life is that I haven't been able to immerse myself, you know, to gain a real mastery of both the language and the literature. It's a, you know, kind of a unique lens through which to see Jewish history as part of my own, you know, family tradition. So that's unquestionably what I would do. I wouldn't worry too much about degrees, but I would uh, certainly do the study. One of my absolutely uh, most favorite books whose name escapes me right right now is a massive like four or five hundred page tome on the history of the Yiddish language totally escapes what it's called but it's really yeah, the story escapes of the me Jewish too people. but I also read that and yes it was a wonderful book <laughs> it's stories of the Jewish people as a flames of right. language or something it was right. unbelievable and it's a great suggestion my final question I'm always curious about people's schedules what time do you go to sleep at night and what time do you wake up in the morning I go to sleep at two o'clock in the morning really uh, yes and I, I get up uh, 
I love your schedule. I feel very connected to you right now. Of all the answers I've ever gotten, I think our schedules are most in sync. I am a night owl in the same way, and I very much appreciate uh, that response. Adina, what time do you go to sleep at night, and what time do you wake up in the morning? I mean, I go to sleep, except on Friday night when I go to sleep earlier. I go to sleep at 1 o'clock in the morning. Um, I'm also at like in our family, we're basically night owls. I think it's genetic actually. And uh, when I get up, depends a little bit about on my son's schedule and whatever, although my husband usually gets out with him. So I, you know, I, I get up about 8.30, 8.30 in the morning. To the entire Yaffe family joining us today, I can't thank you enough for your time. Thank you so much for joining us on the 1840 podcast. Good to be with you. Our pleasure. I found it so moving that Dr. Adina Yaffe's journey involved NCSY, an organization that I'm not only affiliated with and work for, but one that is foundational in my own life. My father's journey to the Orthodox community also began with a connection to NCSY. And what I think it underscores in many ways is how even though it seems and it feels to us like our communities are so far apart, we really do overhear the chatter and the conversation that we say to one another. And every movement wants to attract more followers. Every movement and denomination believes in their own truth. But we have to make sure that the things that each of us respectively say about one another doesn't prevent that familial disruption that will lead a taste in somebody's mouth that they would never want to affiliate with such people. And too often, and maybe it's because I spend too much time on social media where the discourse sometimes is uglier than necessary, I think we need to learn the way of how to express both ideological differences in the most serious ways, but also deep familial love. And I want to share with you, and I'll give you the exact source that I quoted earlier in the introduction from Rabbi Menashe Klein. It is in his responsa in the sixth volume, Chelek Vav, and it is a series of individual responsa, numbers 27 to 30, that you can read his discourse where he discusses the difficulties both in halacha and on a personal emotional level about building that capacity to love the full spectrum of the Jewish people. And I want to read what I had translated earlier directly inside. Kol zeh, all of this, kasavti bekitzer. I wrote it very briefly, bizman during a time, shalo yom velo laila, when it wasn't day and it wasn't night. Ki ani tarad ma'od, I am very swamped and burdened. Amnam, nevertheless, lefisha isi, the fact that I see ba'avonosenu harabim, with our great sins, bedor hazeh, in this generation, mekatne hadas, the small-mindedness. Lefisha ra'u, because they see the small minded people Eze Gadol Vitzadik, one great leader, one righteous person, Shekinas Hashem Tzavakos, who gets zealous and emphasizes those very real ideological differences, Dover Zel Lefanim, Kilo Befiv, that some great leader might even curse or say something extraordinarily negative, Ubitel Belibol, and really dismisses in his heart. What happens? You hear that once from a great leader, Ba'u Chas Vishalom, God forbid, Talmidim, that great leader's students, Shaloshimshu Kaltzarchem, who didn't really understand the full picture of their teacher, who did say something negative, who did have a major ideological difference. But they're small-minded students who don't really understand the full picture. What happens? Verotzim l'aleches bedrachav, and they want to imitate their teacher. Davka, specifically b'midazu, with this characteristic, l'kalel b'nei Yisrael, and they just want to curse out other Jews. Avol b'shar midosav, in the other things that this leader, who did express something negative, who did emphasize some very real ideological divides and maybe even cross the line. But that's the only thing that they want to imitate. Bishar Midosav and the other characteristics that they didn't overhear. Shehaya Yoshev Uboche was sitting and crying al Tsarasan Shel Yisroel on the difficulties of the Jewish people. Umasru Nafsham and would give up their lives al Pachos Shebepechusim on the lowliest Jews. Vahayu Oskim Yomam Valayla Betora Vavoda and was spending day and night on the service and the study of Torah. Al Zel Lo Rotsim Lihidavik Bimidosam. On that characteristic, they don't want to imitate their teacher. They only want to imitate the negativity, but they don't want to imitate those tears, those cries, those bechias Al-Tsarasan Shel Yisroel, on the difficulties of the Jewish people. And the fact that it seems that we all saw that in that headline that I mentioned in the introduction, to not feel instinctively bothered by this, that that could even be possible, is something that I am still grappling with. 
And I hope that the conversation today was some small roadway or window to figure out how to balance very real ideological differences with that underlying familial connection that bonds us, Am Yisrael, the Jewish people, together now and forever. So thank you so much for listening. This episode, like so many of our episodes, was edited by our brilliant friend Dina Emerson. It wouldn't be a Jewish podcast without a little bit of Jewish guilt. So if you enjoyed this episode or any episode, please subscribe, rate, review, tell your friends about it. You can also donate at 1840.org slash donate. That's 18FORTY.org slash donate. It really helps us reach new listeners and continue putting out great content. And thank you again so much to our series sponsor, our friend, Mr. Danny Turkel, and our episode sponsor, my teacher, Rabbi Dr. Ari Bergman. You can also leave us a voicemail with feedback or questions that we may play on a future episode. That number is 917-720-5629. Once again, that's 917-720-5629. If you'd like to learn more about this topic or some of the other great ones we've covered in the past, be sure to check out 1840.org. Once again, that's the number 18, followed by the word 40, F-O-R-T-Y dot org, where you can also find videos, articles, recommended readings, and weekly emails. Thank you so much for listening, and stay curious, my friends.